This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay, as I mentioned, we're in that section of Mark, the love and the hate section of Mark, where uh, I, I hope you'll see this as we study together. Uh, the contrast that's given here is, is intended. There's a sharp contrast. The, the sharp contrast between the, the, the hatred of the chief priests, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day who hated him and I struggle to find a word that's strong enough to emphasize that because the word hate uh, just, just doesn't do it. They, uh, they wanted to murder him, and they wanted to do it now, and they wanted to uh, torture him, and they, they got their wish, didn't they? But that's all of that ugliness and evil is in sharp contrast to the story of Mary here anointing him. And then we have the story of Judas. And then we have the story of the Lord's Supper. So you see how this goes back and forth in Mark chapter 14. Uh, let's start with that hatred in the first couple of verses. Now the Passover and the unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. What's happening here is, and we're, we're, as we get into the last couple of chapters of the book of Mark, we're getting right to the end. And I know that you're going to want to see what's coming. And those episodes will be very significant. Here we're leading in to that very significant time when all of God's plan for redeeming man is going to come to fruition. And the ones who are, are pushing it forward are the ones who hate him the most. They knew that their time to get him was, was growing uh, short. In just a couple of days, the Passover is going to be observed in Jerusalem. Now, what you need to know is that Josephus, the, uh, the historical uh, writer, the Greek, uh, the, the, the Hebrew uh, historian, records that at this time in history, in the first century, at the Passover time, there were three million people from all over the world would arrive to observe the Passover. And that, what's incredible about that is, and those of you who have been to Jerusalem, that Jerusalem's a tiny little place, really. And if, if you can imagine three million people there, and the, the problem with three million people being there and the scribes and the Pharisees trying to carry out their plan is, Jesus was very popular among the people outside of the leaders. And so they, they knew that they couldn't do it after all that crowd got there. They, their time was running out. They had two days left to carry out their plan by stealth, as the New American Standard says here. They were trying to figure out some way to get him. And they knew they had to get him now. And here's, here's a principle that you'll see throughout the Bible, and you can see it in human nature. Hate can't wait. When people hate, they cannot wait to do their evil. And these Pharisees just couldn't wait. This urgency that they felt, they're going to get him. So they're putting together their plan to get him. And they knew of no other way to get him and discredit him than to destroy him. All right. That's, that's the hate part of the opening of chapter 14. Now 
we, we switch over to that thread of love, and we'll look at that when we come back right after this. Okay, in sharp contrast then, as you look at this map, we have an incident that occurred in Bethany. Now, Bethany's just a little bitty village right outside of Jerusalem, uh, and you can see it there on the map. And now here's, here's a, an artist's depiction of what it must have looked like around the time of Christ. And I, I want you to be able to visualize this because it's, this is a pretty good uh, description, a pretty good uh, uh, depiction, if, if you will, of what it must have looked like. Having been there and seen the little villages that are around, this, this uh, actually is, is a pretty good idea if you need something to help visualize it. Just a little place, just a tiny, uh, just a little uh, bump in the road, uh, uh, just a tiny little community, not significant at all, but a place where an event takes place that we're still talking about thousands of years later, a very significant event. Look at verse 3. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman. I'm going to stop right there and, and, and uh, say to you that Mark doesn't name this woman. But we know from the parallel account in the Gospel of John that it, it was Mary. And it was the Mary who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Jesus had these close friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who lived in Bethany. Okay, you've got all of that. Let's pick it up again. While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you wish you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly, I say to you, Whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. It's a beautiful section, isn't it? And Mark says that this took place in the home of Simon the leper. And I want to go through this uh, verse by verse for just a second with you because there's lots to unravel here. We don't know anything uh, additional about Simon the leper other than what is revealed right here. Apparently, Simon had been a leper who had been healed, and he maintained the, the distinction of being Simon the leper to distinguish him from other Simons, like Simon Peter. Simon was a very common name in the first century, so this, this set him apart. Everybody would know who Simon the leper was. And likely, Simon the leper was giving this meal in honor of Jesus' visit, in honor of uh, what was going to take place in the Passover. Uh, so he invited Jesus' closest friends in that area, in Bethany, Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus. Just uh, a few days earlier, Lazarus had been dead and had been raised. And so this would have been a very important celebration. And Simon would have been doing this to show honor both to Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Jesus and, and others. So it was a very proper thing to do and a very important event. And uh, we get some additional information when we look at the Gospel of John. In John 12 and verse 3, the scripture says, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, 
of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It's probably important for me to remind you of the customary traditional greeting that would occur in the first century in a Jewish home. When you were invited as a guest to come to someone's house, the first thing that would happen when you came through the door, you removed your sandals and, and the host of the event would wash your feet. Uh, this was something that was done as a custom and a very refreshing custom. You would walk there, your feet would get dirty on the path, your feet would probably be tired. So it was a way of doing something very nice, very refreshing, and very practical for the purposes of sitting reclining at a table where your feet would be close to someone else's face as you ate. It's probably a good idea to clean them up before you got to the table. Something else would occur. Because we're talking about a day and a time where um, people didn't have access to the kind of shower facilities that we have today. Uh, anointing people with perfumes and oils as they came into your home also was something that was done. It was refreshing. Uh, it was single, uh, singling them out as being important to you to do that. And there was also a practical reason for doing that if, uh, if you'll allow me not to get too deep into that. So all of these things would have been normary, n n normal, customary procedures that would have occurred in a home. And uh, most usually it would be done, of course, by the host. In this case, Mary. Mary sees the need to do this. Now, I want you to try to picture this, if you can. Jesus comes into the home. Mary's made the determination that she's going to do something very special. She holds in her hand this very expensive nard. It's in a little, it's in, well, we would call it maybe a glass or a, 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 actually pottery, specifically made for the purpose. It's sealed because once nard is produced and the perfume is exposed to the air, it begins to disintegrate very rapidly. So you have something that's in a sealed container and it's worth, it's worth a lot of money. And she wants to do something here. And Jesus states the reasons why she wants to do it. We'll, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But as she approaches him, she breaks and that's the way you would open this vial. She breaks off the narrow neck of the alabaster vial and she pours the content of the perfume on Jesus' head. And as the rest of the guests watch, they're spellbound by what she's doing. Some of them see this as an act of love and can really uh, relate to what Mary is doing. Some of them, amongst the disciples, the apostles, see this as something awfully extravagant and, and expensive. And they look on with wonder and amazement. And some of them, not only Judas here, who we see verbalizes his concern, but there's, there's an element there among the disciples that wonder, isn't this too much? And Judas becomes the spokesman for the group when he says, why was this perfume wasted? Why was it wasted? Judas sees this as an extravagance that cannot be justified. It could have been sold for 300 denarii. Now, what you need to know about that is this. 300 denarii was equivalent to a year's wage for the average laborer in the first century. If, if you and I were trying to figure out what was that thing worth in, in real money as it relates to us today, you have to put that figure somewhere around uh, 30 or $40,000. What, what would you pay a laborer today in the United States of America 
uh, a year for a year's wage. It's got to be between thirty and forty thousand dollars, doesn't it? Or or maybe more. So I want you to see this. This is not some cheap little gift that's been been given. This is a this is a considerable resource that's now been poured on to Jesus its entirety. And some there say, why? We'll talk about why they were asking that question when we come back right after this. So Judas became the spokesman of this group and he said, why was this perfume wasted? Why? From everything that we know from all of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about Judas, uh, this is very consistent with the attitude that he would have possessed. First of all, he was the bean counter <laughs> of the uh, apostles. He kept charge of the money. And um, uh, uh, bean counters are sometimes very narrow in their view about what ought to be done with money. But in, in Judas's case, there was more to it than just that. He stole from the money that came in. Judas is looking about at this extravagant amount of money involved, and he knew he could have got his little greedy mitts in on that. He was a thief. But there's something else I hope you can see in this story that uh, it's important for us to see. There, there are people who uh, attempt to put a monetary value on everything and who make decisions based upon monetary value, not based upon the good that can be accomplished. And sometimes it's the bean counters who, who, uh, who restrict extravagance, and sometimes it's others who uh, lack a benevolent spirit. But you, you just cannot place a monetary value on everything. What's, what's a sunset worth? in dollars and cents? What's your health worth in dollars and cents? What's, what's the birth of a precious child worth in dollars and cents? You see, you, you can't put money on those items. So what, what is love worth to you? You can't buy love. And this is an expression of love. And even though it was extravagant, well, look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, she has done a good deed to me. And in the New, Amer New International Version, um, it says, she's done a beautiful thing to me. And that's, that's what I want you to see here. This was a beautiful act on Mary's part. And the beauty of it lie in its extravagance. Mary didn't spare any part of this perfume. She poured it all out on Jesus. Thirty, forty thousand dollars worth of perfume. And Judas said, what a waste. And Jesus said, it's beautiful what she's done to me. It was a lavish act, but in that lavishness there was beauty. And there's a second thing that Jesus said. He said it was a timely thing. It was something that she could have only done now. Anytime you want to do good for poor people, you can do good for poor people. They're always going to be around, Jesus said. And it's right to help the poor. But there are opportunities that come in life that you have to seize at that moment opportunities that you you must take advantage of when they come your way. It may not be convenient timing, but it may be the only time. And she knew, Mary knew that this was the only time that she could do this. And that leads me to something else you need to see. Some opportunities only come once. Sometimes if you don't take advantage of the opportunity, you're not going to get another chance. And Mary could see that here. She could see. Now there's something I want to get into next episode that I think is very important for you to see. This is probably the last kind 
thing that is done for Jesus before those horrible days of the crucifixion. But she knew that Jesus was on his way to the cross, and she wanted to do this for him. When we come back next week, we're going to pick up right here in this story. I hope you will be in Bible study with us then. God bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.